Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session of membrane distillation. First, we have our keynote speaker, Alison McGoffey from Princeton University. She'll be giving us a talk on the modes and metrics of wetting in membrane distillation. And I will hand over the session to you, Alison. Great, thank you so much. Let me just share my slides here. And great, can you see my slides? Should be good. Should be good. Okay. All right, so yeah, thank you all for being here today. I'm very honored to be giving this talk. So currently I'm a postdoc at the Anlinger Center at Princeton University. And the work I'm gonna be talking about today is from the tail end of my PhD work with Professor Amy Childress. Uh, so I'll get started with some motivation and background. So as I'm sure everyone here is very familiar, interest in the desalination and reclamation of increasingly challenging higher and higher salinity streams is growing. And we would of course generally prefer to use reverse osmosis for these applications because reverse osmosis is the most energy efficient desalination technology. Reverse osmosis is salinity limited, at least currently. And thermal desalination processes, in contrast, are able to treat high salinity streams. So that brings me to membrane distillation, or MD. So in MD, we have a warmer saline feed stream and a cooler pure distillate stream separated by a microporous hydrophobic membrane. And the temperature difference across the membrane causes water from the feed stream to evaporate at the membrane surface, diffuse through the pores in the vapor phase, and condense upon reaching that cooler distillate. So there's a few advantages of MD. It's been shown to potentially be more efficient than conventional thermal desalination processes, especially at smaller capacities. MD can also utilize lower grade thermal energy and MD is modular with a relatively low capital cost and a small footprint. So this is a SEM image of a typical commercial PTFE MD membrane. The morphology is characterized by the strands of polymer material here, which we call fibrils, and they intersect to form pore openings. And this just shows a schematic of an idealized and simplified version of the membrane structure. So if we imagine a cross-section of that idealized structure, it would look something like this, where we have the feed stream and the distillate stream separated by a vapor gap, which is supported by the membrane. That vapor gap allows us to, in theory, achieve 100% rejection of non-volatile solutes. However, if pore wetting occurs, liquid can penetrate through that pore, resulting in the diffusion of solutes and particulate matter smaller than the pore size through the membrane. So when pore wetting occurs, solute rejection is not achieved. So there's some uh, goal to understand the wetting resistance of MD membranes. And in many cases, researchers rely on what I'm calling ex situ indicators, just referring to parameters that are measured outside the MD process. So contact angle, of course, is used to characterize membrane hydrophobicity. Either the intrinsic or the measured contact angle on the membrane itself are frequently used. And liquid entry pressure, or LEP, is commonly used to characterize wetting resistance. So LEP is defined as the minimum transmembrane pressure at which point liquid is forced through an unwetted pore. And according to the classic models, LEP is understood to depend on the surface tension of the feed solution, the contact angle of the membrane, and the pore size R, which for the minimum LEP, which is generally reported, corresponds to the maximum pore size. So both LEP and contact angles are typically measured using clean or pure water at ambient temperature. But in membrane distillation, the elevated temperatures, elevated salinities, and elevated pressures can affect the interfacial tensions and contact angle, which affects LEP. LEP also does not consider the wetting mechanisms that occur during MD. And I'll mention those on the next slide, but applied pressure as it's used in LEP measurement affects the membrane surface uniformly, concentration polarization, and especially scaling and fouling may not. They can be heterogeneous on the membrane surface. So in these cases, wetting may not initiate at that largest pore, the maximum pore size, but instead where scaling or fouling is most severe. So in a previous study, we reported or introduced rather the LEP distribution based on the pore size distribution to better predict wetting. But these ex situ metrics have limitations and they may not accurately describe wetting that occurs in situ. So the mechanisms that are most relevant to MD 
include alcohol and surfactant induced sweating and fouling and scaling induced sweating. So I've grouped alcohol and surfactant together, not because they're identical, but because both are associated with surface tension effects and fouling and scaling induced sweating are both associated with membrane surface effects. So if surfactants or alcohols are present in the feed solution, they can accumulate at the feed vapor interface due to concentration polarization, which results in a lower surface tension of the feed, which reduces the LEP and can drive wetting. If fouling and scaling or scaling occurs, then crystals and phalanx can deposit or grow on the membrane surface, which can reduce the effective hydrophobicity of the membrane, which reduces LEP and can drive wetting. So poor wetting is a key concern for these industrial wastewaters that MD is often suggested for because in many cases they contain uh, surfactants or alcohols and or can cause fouling or scaling of the membrane. So for this study, we we're interested in looking at in situ indicators to better understand wetting that occurs during MD. So currently studies most often use increases in the distillate conductivity, which is measured, or decreases in rejection, which is calculated from conductivity to indicate wetting. Now in theory, as I mentioned, MD achieves 100% rejection, but in practice, we typically measure values slightly less than 100. So researchers have used arbitrary definitions of low rejection to define wetting. So when the membrane is dry under ideal conditions, we have vapor flux occurring from the feed to the distillate side, and that condensed vapor accumulates as product water or distillate, and from that we can determine net flux. However, when the membrane is wetted, we not only have vapor flux, we also have liquid flux, and with that solute flux through the membrane. And so this is, of course, implicitly understood in the MD literature, but not typically explicitly acknowledged. But when we have liquid flux, we not only have condensed vapor, distillate, accumulating, but also liquid permeate accumulating in our product water. So for that reason, I'll refer to this as the distillate permeate stream for short, just to acknowledge that. And of course, in that case, net flux depends on both the condensed vapor and the permeate passing the membrane. So the objectives of this study were to quantify both liquid flux and vapor flux during MD and introduce liquid flux as an in situ wetting metric to define modes of wetting in MD and to look at the effect of membrane properties on those modes and to evaluate trade-offs between liquid and vapor flux. So that brings me to materials and methods. So this shows a schematic of the bench scale system we used in this study. I just want to note that we do operate with a constant volume in our distillate permeate tank. So as liquid accumulates in product water, it immediately overflows into this vessel and we measure that mass continuously to determine net flux. So in order to determine vapor flux and liquid flux, we just used a very simple solute mass balance. So we equate the mass of the solute entering the distillate permeate stream, which only occurs due to wetting, with what accumulates in the system and what exits in our configuration due to the overflow here. So if we equate these mass terms to concentration by volume, we obtain this, and we can determine solute flux simply as shown here. And liquid flux finally is obtained just by using the known density and the known concentration of the feed solution. And then vapor flux is very simply obtained by subtracting liquid flux from net flux with everything being in units of mass per membrane area per ton. So we make a few simplifying assumptions here. So we assume that liquid flux occurs from the feed to the distillate side. We assume that the liquid wetting the membrane is at a solute concentration equal to the feed solution at the membrane surface where wetting occurs. And we assume that both streams are well mixed. So on to results here. So I first wanna talk about results under baseline conditions. And this is a commercial PTFE membrane. And here I'm showing the contact angle, the maximum surface pore size, and the bulk porosity. So for our baseline tests, we use a one molar sodium chloride feed solution uh, at an ambient or rather moderate temperature. So uh, here I'm showing the concentration of our distillate permeate stream in milligrams per liter sodium chloride. And I'll refer to this as CDP for short. So we see initially the CDP increases and then after about 11 hours, we reach a steady, stable concentration. 
And here I'm showing the net flux and the vapor flux. So we can see at this scale that net and vapor flux are nearly equivalent. So they overlap here. They're also relatively constant throughout operation. And finally, we have our liquid flux. So here, kind of curiously, liquid flux appears to decrease initially. And then after about 11 hours, it's approximately zero. So we know in MD that liquid doesn't stop diffusing through a wetted pore without intervention. So this suggests that something other than wetting is occurring. So if I bring back our bench scale system here, when we complete an experiment, we drain our distillate permeate tank and we rinse the tubing and tank with deionized water, in our case, until conductivity is below two microsiemens per centimeter and stable for several hours. And then when we begin a new experiment, we of course replenish this tank and begin pumping. So if any higher salinity water remains in the heat exchanger or the probe fittings, then that will begin to mix as we pump, which results in a initial increase in concentration. And then when the stream is fully mixed, a stable concentration. So we're attributing this to solute mixing, which is indicated by increasing CDP, but apparently decreasing liquid flux. And this is an experimental artifact, not indicating poor wetting or membrane performance. And we believe this is not unique to our system, but likely common in recirculating systems and may account for some of the non-idealities in rejection that have been previously observed. And I'll also mention quickly that if we had operated for five hours or less, which is commonly reported for initial membrane performance, based on CDP alone, this would appear to be wetting. However, if we look at liquid flux, we can see that decrease and we know that it is not wetting. Okay, so now on to actual wetting results. So this is a second commercial PTFE membrane. It has a similar contact angle and similar bulk porosity, but a larger pore size. And we also operated here under baseline conditions. And we see that CDP increased steadily in this case throughout operation. Net and vapor flux also are very similar. They overlap here throughout operation. They're also relatively constant. And then in this case, liquid flux is also relatively constant throughout operation. So this suggests that one or more pores wetted initially and remained wetted throughout operation, resulting in this constant leak of liquid through the wetted portions of the membrane. And we can also note here that liquid flux is about two orders of magnitude lower than vapor flux, which suggests that most of the membrane remained dry. So most of those pores were only allowing vapor through and only a few pores were wetted. So at constant liquid flux, we call this constant wetting mode, indicated by increasing CDP at constant liquid flux. And we can also predict the final concentration of our product water simply by assuming constant vapor flux and constant liquid flux continues after our 24 hours of operation. And for this membrane, we obtain about three and a half milligrams per liter of sodium chloride in our final product water. And notably that may meet quality requirements depending on the application. So in this case, wetting may not require intervention. Constant wetting can be tolerable. And before I get on to the next portion of the talk, I want to first look at liquid flux in comparison to rejection, which has been commonly used. So here at the top, I have the QMO5 membrane that did not wet, but we did observe solute mixing effects and below the QL822 membrane, which wetted under constant wetting mode. So in both cases, rejection is actually relatively constant. So rejection does not show these wetting trends as clearly, and that's especially true for these cases where liquid flux is very low for identification of wetting early on and for uh, initial identification of, of low wetting rates. And also we can note that if we look at the slope of the conductivity of our distillate permeate stream, the trend is in both cases virtually identical to liquid flux. So slope of conductivity can be a proxy for liquid flux, but without these meaningful units, so we can't understand wetting rates quantitatively or compare to vapor flux. Okay, so we also looked at some different solution chemistry effects. So here is a third commercial PTFE membrane, and it again has a similar contact angle, similar bulk porosity, but a intermediate pore size. And this top row shows performance with a surfactant containing feed solution. So we saw that CDP began to increase pretty early on and increased rapidly. 
we see that net and vapor flux initially are very similar, they overlap, but at longer operating times, vapor flux is slightly lower than net flux, suggesting that more pores were wetted. And then if we look at liquid flux, we now see that liquid flux increases over time. And this suggests that at our constant operating conditions, more and more pores were becoming wetted, resulting in more and more liquid flux. And this is likely due to increasing bulk concentration of surfactant. We also looked at a high salinity feed solution using sodium chloride as a model scalant. And we see that pretty similarly, CDP increases relatively early and more rapidly. And we see that net and vapor flux in this case are similar and overlapping throughout operation, indicating that most pores remain dry. But again, if we look at liquid flux, we see that once wetting occurs, it increases over time. So for that reason, we're calling this increasing wetting mode characterized by increasing CDP and increasing liquid flux. And notably, this will eventually require intervention as CDP will exceed our product water quality requirements at some point. So we also were interested in how membrane properties affect wetting. And here I'm showing results for pore size. So here I've just repeated the results from the previous slide for our QMO22 membrane with the high salinity feed solution. And we also looked at the performance of our QMO50 membrane, which was our good membrane that did not wet under the same conditions. So here we see that although we've delayed increases, we still see a relatively rapid increase in CDP. Net and vapor flux for this membrane, also very similar and overlapping throughout operation, indicating that most of the membrane did remain dry. This decrease is likely due to scaling of the membrane surface. And similarly with liquid flux, we see a delay, but we still see this increasing trend. So we saw increasing wetting for both. Despite differences in pore size, both of these membranes wetted in increasing wetting mode. And the last thing I wanna to mention today is looking at how membrane thickness affected wetting. So for this, we used electrospun membranes and here I'm showing the contact angle, maximum surface pore size again, and also the membrane thickness. And we tested these again under our baseline conditions. So here we see results for our CDP versus time. And we see that this membrane wetted relatively quickly after just about an hour of operation and CDP increased relatively rapidly. We see that net and vapor flux initially are very similar and overlapping suggesting the membrane was dry or mostly dry. And eventually vapor flux was slightly lower than net flux. And if we look at liquid flux, we see this increasing trend. So here for the first time, I'm showing increasing wetting mode under baseline conditions. So not associated with solution chemistry effects, but with some material property. And because these membranes had a relatively similar contact angle and pore size compared to the PTFE membranes I showed earlier, we are attributing this or hypothesizing that this is due to a different membrane property and it's likely due to high pore interconnectivity or in other words, permeability of the membrane parallel to the membrane surface. So one or more large pores may have wetted and then liquid was able to permeate to adjacent pores um, due to high pore interconnectivity resulting in wetting of more and more pores over time resulting in greater and greater liquid flux, even at baseline conditions. So we next looked at a second electrospun membrane, which was spun under the same conditions with the same material, but for a longer amount of time. So resulting in a similar contact angle, similar pore size, but a greater membrane thickness. And here I am expanding the time axis from three hours now to 30 hours. So we saw that CDP increased much more slowly, but steadily throughout operation. Net and vapor flux for this membrane were similar and overlapping throughout operation, indicating most of the membrane did remain dry. And then when we look at liquid flux, we see a delay, but we again see that increasing trend in liquid flux. And here I'm expanding the y-axis to make that more clear so we can see liquid flux increases over time. And finally, we tested a third electrospun membrane. Again, similar contact angle, similar pore size, but greater membrane thickness. And now expanding our time access to 55 hours, 
we see that although it increases more slowly, CDP increases steadily throughout operation. Net and vapor flux are similar and overlapping throughout operation. But liquid flux, although we did get a longer delay, we still saw that increasing trend in liquid flux. So similar to pore size, we saw that thickness apparently does not affect the wetting mode. And we can also see here a trade-off between vapor flux and liquid flux due to membrane thickness, which is not typically understood to affect liquid entry pressure. So this is kind of interesting. So we see that as membrane thickness decreases, we obtain higher vapor flux, but at the same time, wetting is more severe and occurs earlier. So that brings me to my conclusions. So here I'm just showing all of the data that was used in this paper, uh, including the polypropylene results that I, I didn't quite have time for today. But we saw increasing CDP, a decrease in liquid flux, especially at short operating times. And we attribute that to solute mixing, which is an experimental artifact that may be common in recirculating systems. We saw increasing CDP at constant liquid flux, and we call that constant wetting mode, which we showed in some cases may be tolerable. We saw increasing CDP with increasing liquid flux, and we call that increasing wetting mode, and we saw that that uh, was associated with solution chemistry effects for surfactant, as well as scaling-induced wetting, independent of membrane pore size. And finally, we saw increasing CDP at increasing liquid flux under baseline conditions for certain membrane materials. And we're hypothesizing that this may be due to high pore interconnectivity, which is a subject of ongoing study in the Children's Research Group. And with that, I will conclude just by quickly acknowledging the funding for this talk, or for this work, rather. So this uh, was funded by an NSF grant. I was also supported by these fellowships during my time at USC. Parker Performance Materials supplied the PTFE membranes that we used. Of course, thank my research group and the Smith Group for supplying the electrospin membranes that we used, and my current research groups, which are the Priestley Lab and the Princeton Wet Lab. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, for this interesting talk. Um, is there any questions? Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, Fei Guo has asked, um, I have two questions about the electrospun membranes. What is the material you, you make the ES membranes? I saw some beads in the SEM images of the ES membranes. Do you think whether the beads can affect the wetting? Yeah, those are great questions. Thank you for asking that. So the material we used was a blend actually of PVDF as well as PVDF HFP, um, hexafluoropylene, I think. And so uh, it was a relatively hydrophobic material. But yeah, we did see these beads, and that was a, an issue that we didn't end up optimizing for. I do think that that may have affected wetting and potentially opened up larger gaps in the membrane, maybe giving it a larger effective pore size than what we characterized um, by, you know, providing this large chunk of, of polymer material, but opening up gaps potentially below it or around it. So that's not something we looked at, but it's a really good point. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you, Alison and Faye. Um, is there any other questions? So I have a quick question about um, what is your recommendation for fabricating a membrane that is suitable for membrane distillation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that's something that I think this work definitely leads to. So I think that reducing pore size is something that has been less explored in the literature than just increasing the contact angle of the membrane, but could be a more robust way to impart wetting resistance, especially for scaling induced wetting. And that's something that also our, or my previous paper kind of led to. So, and then also increasing membrane thickness might be a way to kind of maintain the materials that are lower cost, but less hydrophobic or easier to work with, you know, not these perfluorinated materials. So we can mitigate liquid flux without 
you know, increasing the surface hydrophobicity as much. So I think those are two avenues that might be able to increase wetting resistance. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alison. Um, um, so I'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Alison. Right. Um, so our next speaker is Jing Cheng Tai from Dalian University of Technology. He'll be giving us a talk about membrane failure analysis in membrane distillation processes. Um, so I'll hand over the session to you, Jing Cheng. Okay, thank you. My name is Cai Jingcheng. I'm from Dalian University of Technology. I'm a student of Professor Fei Guo. Uh, his presentation will be in the afternoon. And our first work is membrane failure analysis during membrane distillation processes. According to the terminology of membrane distillation, no condensation should take place inside the post of the membranes as they may cause membrane failure. This study, uh, we focus on the condensation in the membrane pores under certain conditions during MD processes. Uh, commercial um, P hydrophobic PTFV membrane were used in this work. Uh, the membrane morphology was characterized uh, by SEM and the uh, uh, lab scale REP unit was to measure the liquid entry pressure. Uh, the product meter contact angle porosity and the REP will show in the uh, table. And the uh, 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 air gap membrane distillation uh, system was uh, used uh, in our work to measure the mem uh, membrane distillation MD performance. Uh, we start uh, our study from the observation and the confirmation of membranes uh, in the membrane processes to confirm the membrane failure. Uh, the, uh, we start our first experiment with the membrane thickness 105 micrometer. Uh, then under the, we see some bulges uh, in the membrane surface and the membrane weight of after MD test is uh, 70, 37.67 grams. And that after drying was 33.5. Uh, 0.59 grams, that's the water, uh, that's the condensate is inside the membranes and it may cause the, the uh, bulges in the membrane surface. Uh, the membrane used in, in this work, uh, then is PDFV membranes with the process of 1.22 uh, micrometers and the news number is 1.65, that's the transition diffusion is used to describe the mass transfer. Um, the experimental data is not uh, agree with the uh, theoretical establishments. The B values established from Nielsen diffusion decreased about five percentage, and uh, uh, established from Malacca diffusion and the transition diffusion increases with the temperature. But in our experiment, the B values decreases about the thirty-seven percentage. Uh, and we start our, another experiment. Uh, uh, at a, a fixed temperature of feed of 70 centigrade and a cooling temperature of 20 centigrade and run for 12 hours. Uh, that's uh, in, uh, as usual, it, uh, the permanent flux and the B value should be kept constant, but in our test, the B permanent flux and the B value decreases with the running time. Uh, the mass of the um, MD module is uh, after MD test, uh, was 40.13 grams and that after uh, drying was 37.87 grams. That's the condensate is also having the uh, in the membranes. That's we can, um, we may draw a conclusion that the decreasing tendency of B values in the BT diagram may indicate the condensation occurs in MD processes. The condensation inside the uh, the membrane pores we can uh, show in the following mechanisms. Uh, the cylinder pores, the, the mass transfer in the cylinder pores can be described by Darcy's law. In the hydrophobic membranes, uh, when condensation happens, the mass transfer uh, should be uh, described in the following um, pictures. In the hydrophobic membrane, the contact angle is higher than 
uh, 90 centigrade, that's the condensation pressure may be higher than the saturated pre, um, uh, vapor pressure. That's the condensation inside the membrane pores may decrease the drying force of MD. That's the B values established by Darcy's law from the permanent flux and the feed temperature and the cooling temperature may be decreased. The condensation is more likely to occur in MD with the high feed temperature and the thick membranes. In this work, in this experiment, we used use three kind of membrane thickness. Uh, in the membranes uh, with a thickness of 80, um, 80 micrometers, the B values keep the constant and uh, no voids in the membrane surface. There's no condensation uh, in the membranes. In the membrane thickness with, uh, in, for the membrane thickness of 112 millimeter, the B value decreases significantly and the, C, and the large number and the diameter voids in the membrane surface, that condensation occurs in the membrane surface. That's the significant decreases in the B values indicates a large number and the diameter of voids. That's the condensation occurs inside the membrane pores. This is because the thick membranes or high temperature also leads, uh, leads to uh, leads to a large temperature difference across the membranes. That the pressure gradient across the membrane increases. That may lead to concentration condensation inside the uh, membrane pores. Uh, uh, another work we do is uh, uh, for um, different uh, cooling temperature that. Uh, uh, that's the condensation is more likely to occur in MD with low uh, cooling temperature. Uh, for the temperature keep at uh, 35 centigrade, the membrane surface uh, keep is flat and no bulges in the membrane surface. And uh, an increase of B values indicates no condensation uh, occurs inside the membrane pores. For the membrane, uh, for the MD processes with cooling temperature keep at five centigrade, uh, the membrane surface shows some bulge. That's a significant decrease in the B values. Also indicates a large number and the diameter of bulge. And this is because the low cooling temperature also leads to a higher temperature difference across the membranes. That's uh, increase the temperature difference uh, in, uh, across the membranes. A lower cooling temperature uh, increases the number of di uh, number and the diameter of the bulges. Uh, through our experiment, uh, we found the higher temperature can reduce the probability uh, of condensation inside the membrane pores. Then, and it also has a very little effect on the uh, permanent flux. Uh, the, uh, the condensation is more li likely to occur in MD with small air gap wise. Uh, the air gap is has uh, the air gap has a uh, uh, sorry <laughs> the air gap has a uh, very significant uh, effects on the high mass transfer and his transfer in uh, MD in AGMD for the membrane with the four uh, millimeter air gaps their membrane keeps blind and no bulges in the membrane surface the B uh, values to keep the constant. That's no condensation in the membranes. Then a smaller air gap with the air gap of one millimeters, the membrane voice is very significantly that condensation inside the membrane pores. That's the smaller air gap wise increases the number and the diameter of the bodies. Uh, compare with the air gap and the feed temperature, cooling temperature, we found the influence of air gap is greater than the membrane thickness feed temperature and the cooling temperature. This is because the heat resistance comes mostly from the air gap in HMD system. The temperature difference across the membrane increases significantly with the decreasing air gap wise. We do our final work is, uh, is on the multi-layer membranes. We found the condensation is always happening in the multi-layer uh, membranes. For the single membrane, we use the thickness of 80 uh, micrometer, there's no condensation in the membranes. That's uh, the condensation uh, effect that should, uh, can be neglected. That's we found a significant decrease uh, decreases from 40 to uh, 70 centigrade. Uh, 
with two layers and three layers membrane um, um, MD processes. The significant decreases in the B values indicates the condensation occurs in the gap between the membranes. This is because the water vapor decreases in the temperature during the expansion from the membrane poles to a thin gap between the membranes. The thermal conduct resistance, resistance exists at the membrane interfaces and it reflects itself in the jump in the temperature field. Through our experiment, we draw the following conclusions. Condensation in the membrane poles can happen under, under certain conditions during MD processes and leading to membrane failure. The condensation is more likely to occur for the membranes with large thickness, high porosity, low thermal conductivity, small intrinsic work there contact angle, large pore size, and multi layers. Some operating conditions can also cause the condensation due to the MD processes, such as high feed temperature, low coolant temperature and small or gap. The decreasing tendency of B value in BT diagram indicates condensation in the membrane pores. The membrane, uh, the mass transfer processes can maintain a hydrophobic, can maintain a dynamic equilibrium in the pores when condensation takes place. Condensation in the membrane pores can decrease the membrane performance in terms of permanent flux by reducing the driving force uh, for membrane transfer. And that's all, thank you. Thank you, Ching Chen, for your interesting talk. Um, is there any questions regarding Ching Chen's talk? So um, Jing Chen, I have a quick, quick question for you. Um, <clears throat> is there any conductivity um, or did you do any tests in the saline effluent in your test? Did you test your membrane, your, your membrane distillation operation for any salt solution? Uh, yes, yes, this is the, so the, 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 the feed was used the sluffer uh, copper sulfur uh, 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 copper sulfur uh, um, solutions and the concentration is one is uh, concentration is 3.5 uh, uh, mass the mass trend, the mass concentration is uh, three uh, three point five percentage. Um, so what is the relationship between increasing the air gap and the conductivity change in your permeate? Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. I, I can't... Oh, so like, so like in, by increasing the air gap, you say um, you can decrease the failure rate for membrane distillation, right? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what is the... Con what is the conductivity change in the permeate if you increase the air gap? Did you also anal analyze that? Uh, we didn't we were, anal analyze the in this work, but, but uh, we do some uh, analysis in the other works that the air gap uh, increases and the temperature difference uh, uh, across the membrane decreases significantly. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. I have a quick question as well. Um, I was wondering, I think I've read in some previous papers that system shutdown or intermittent operation can be associated with condensation in the pores. Is that something you guys looked at or you can comment on? Uh, thanks for your question, but, but can you uh, slow down? <laughs> Slow down, I see. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Of course. Yeah, I was just referring to um, like system shutdown. So like turning the temperature gradient off, turning your heater off so that the temperature difference across the membrane goes away. And I've read, I think some papers that mentioned that wetting can occur when the temperature gradient is paused or stopped. 
So for like intermittent operation, like if you're turning your heat source off and on. Hmm. I, I'm sorry, but I don't, I, I, I actually. No <laughs> I think Alison meant um, if you stop your operation, like um, if you stop your operation, then if you start it again, you you might expect a wetting during that time because um, there might be some condensation inside the pores. Do you agree with that? What's your opinion about that? Uh, that may happen, but uh, uh, when we stop our experiment, we take the membrane, we take the membrane module out and we wait the membranes and we found the bulges in the membrane surface. That may happen when we stop the um, MD process that the conditions change significantly. That may cause the condensation inside the pores. Uh, but but we have we do another experiment with uh, uh, with electric electrical spinning membranes. We we use um uh, uh acrylic uh, acrylic modules that we can see the uh, we can see we can uh, we can see the membrane surface and we also uh, find some bulges on the membrane surface. That that's the membrane width also increases. That's the way I think uh, the uh, membrane, uh, the bulge is uh, always happened, uh, may happen in, the condensation may happen in the MD processes. Okay, thank Great. you, Jing Chang. Thank okay, you. okay, thank you. Okay, great. I think it's uh, about time to move on. So our next speaker is my co-host, Wenwei Zhang, and she is going to be speaking about membrane distillation uh, wetting by naturally existing surfactants in traditional Chinese medicine or TCM extracts. So I think we have a recording for this, so we'll get that going. Good morning, everyone. I'm Wen Wei from Guangzhou Institute of Advanced Technology. I'm honored to be presenting our recent work on wetting by naturally existing surfactants in traditional Chinese medicine solution by direct contact membrane distillation. As this is a session dedicated to membrane distillation, I will skip the introduction on the general principle of membrane distillation. Without further ado, let's begin. Membrane distillation has been an emerging desalination technology for water treatment. We've noticed a growing research interest in the concentration by MD in food and pharmaceutical processing, such as fruit juice and maple syrup. MD has also been applied in the water removal for herbal and TCM extracts. However, we know that there are large amount of naturally existing surfactants present in the herbal extracts. They might cause membrane wetting. Membrane wetting is one of the major issues hindering the application of MD in the industry. Wetting could cause direct liquid penetration and failure to the concentration process as the bioactive compounds can pass through the membrane. It was believed that wetting could happen when the liquid pressure, liquid entry pressure is lower than the transmembrane pressure, or the absorption of the amphiphilic compounds rendering the hydrophobic membrane to hydrophilic. Although surfactants could lower the surface tension of the solution, recent studies suggested that wetting criterion of the transmembrane pressure to be higher than the liquid entry pressure might not be applicable in surfactant-induced wetting. In the surfactant-induced wetting case, wetting is not instantaneous, it's transient, and wetting behavior is highly related to the surfactant properties. This could mean that solution environment is critical to determine the wetting behavior of the membrane. It is important for us to also know that in the TCM extract, 
the solution chemistry is extremely complicated. Although saminates are known as the surfactants typically present in herbal and TCM extracts, the chemistry of the saminate is hard to identify, especially whether they are ionic or not. That means the interaction between the membrane and the surfactant in the aqueous environment is hard to predict. Hence, in this study, we would firstly like to characterize the model TCM solution made up with saponin. And we performed a static absorption test on the PVDF membrane in the model TCM solution. And later, we performed a dynamic concentration test by MD in the model TCM solution. This is the operating condition selected for this study. The data was collected in the custom built DCMD configuration every one minute. We selected three typical saponins abundant in herbal plants and TCM. They are T saponin, ginseng saponin, and glyceric acid. We noticed that GA solution was very viscous at higher concentration. The linear correlation between the concentration and conductivity mm -hmm. confirmed that all three selected saponins in this study are non-ionic surfactants. By measuring the surface tension of the solution at different concentration, we determined a range of CMC values for the three saponins. CMC is also known as critical micelle concentration. It's an important factor for surfactants as it gives information on the surface tension of the solution at a given concentration. The surface tension of GS and TS were similar above their CMC values. Their potential values were also similar. During the static test for PVDF membrane in t saponin solution, we chose a value of 0.1 and 1 gram per liter as the concentration below and above the critical micelle concentration. We observed that PVDF membrane showed little absorption affinity to the t saponin solution in both cases. However, Complete absorption was observed in T saponin solution of 10 grams per liter after the 24 hours test. We were also interested in the absorption behavior of Janus PDA modified PVDF membrane during a static test. And we observed that the PVDA coated PVDF membrane was able to resist the TS absorption for 24 hours during the static test. Then we conducted a series of dynamic concentration tests in TS solution at a concentration of 1, 5 and 10 grams per liter. We found that gradual wetting happened at 4 hours in the highest concentration and the permeate conductivity slowly increased to the same value as the feed solution. We suspected a complete wetting at the end of the experiment. Mm -hmm. In the test of 5 gram per liter, gradual inc increase in permeate conductivity was observed from 15 hours onwards. However, the conductivity did not continue to rise up to the level of feed solution. Although we couldn't see a rapid increase in the conductivity change in the 1 gram per liter test, flux decline was significant in the TS solution. And we conducted an SEM analysis on the membrane surface after the test. We confirmed that the pore on the permeate side was completely blocked by a layer of deposition. Later, we also conducted a dynamic concentration test in the GS solution with PVDF membrane, and we observed a similar trend of wetting behavior. However, we did not see a flux decline 
in the GS solution at low concentration. We were also interested in the PDA coated PVDF membrane on the wet and resistance in the TS solution at 10 grams per liter. We found that although PVDF PDA membrane showed little absorption affinity in the static test in the TS solution, complete wetting was still observed within 24 hours during the MD operation. Wetting initiated at roughly the same time as the PVDF membrane, but PDA coated membrane could postpone complete wetting. We conducted a contact angle measurement on both the membranes from the dynamic concentration test. Both membranes showed a drastic reduction in the contact angle, but the PDA coated membrane had a higher contact angle values. We suspected that the rate of TS absorption might be lower in the PDA coated membrane. We highlighted these findings from the work I introduced just now. T segment absorption onto the PVDF membrane was significant at much higher concentration of its CMZ value. The wetting behaviors of for PVDF membrane in TS and GS solution were similar regarding their similar properties at high concentrations. It is still unclear what might have caused a difference in the dynamic test in TS and GS solution at low concentration. PDA coated PVDF membrane might be able to postpone the complete wetting while the time taken for the occurrence of wetting was similar to PVDF membrane. Due to time limit, I'm only able to show this results with you all. In the end, I would like to appreciate the work done by our students who were affected by this COVID situation and could not return to Australia. Wan Yu and Ming Zhang, previous student at University of Sydney, and Xiao Wei, current undergraduate student at UNSW. She's also looking for PhD opportunities. This project was funded by National Key Research and Development Program of China and China Postdoctoral Science Foundation. Thank you all for listening. Great, thank you so much for that talk. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A or the chat. Um, I'll get us started off here. I was wondering, do you think there's any role of surface roughness in sorption of surfactants on membranes other than just intrinsic contact angle? Oh, I think so too. So we probably are going to look into that too. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if we have any other questions for the speaker, feel free to type them in. I was also curious about the um, wetting curves you observed for conductivity kind of showed a a slow increase and then this sharp breakthrough before it reached the like complete wetting. Can you comment on why you think that is? Right. Um, so the experimental setup was um, was done by using um, a conductivity meter that dipped into the permeate uh, the permeate stream. So we might think that the um, conductivity meter might not be that sensitive. So like. Um, that's why we also use the line to connect the points. So like we observe that um, the conductivity of the permeate that's probably around 30 or like, and then it jumped up very drastically at some point. So um, not sure if that's due to the, um, the sensitivity of what we have in our lab. So we might want to uh, further analyze, analyze what's, what's What's also causing that too? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, I think it's actually time for us to move on right. to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Wenwei.
So our next speaker is Feng Shu Chu, and uh, who will be speaking about performance and membrane fouling during landfill leachate treatment using direct contact membrane distillation, a comparison of young and aged landfill leachate. So Feng Shu, I'll leave it to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, Alison, thank you for your introduction. Uh, good morning, every, uh, good morning, dear friends. Uh, my name is Peng Su Qu. I'm from Guangzhou University. Um, I'm glad to introduce some of my work here, uh, but it's a pity that we cannot meet in Shanghai and discuss uh, some interesting, uh, interesting uh, topics uh, face to face. Uh, my topic is uh, about uh, land, uh, land biolichid treatment with membrane distillation performance and uh, uh, membrane flowering. Uh, as we know, uh, <clears throat> urban, uh, urbanization is uh, becoming fast, uh, faster. More and more people uh, live in cities. This may lead to generation of a large amount of municipal solid wastes. To protect the environment, uh, sanitary landfill is used to uh, treat the uh, municipal solid wastes, but this may cause the problem of landfill leachate. Uh, as we know, land uh, fuel leachate has many problems uh, like uh, high in quantities, uh, high in ammonia concentration, and uh, low in biodegradability. Uh, <clears throat> till now, uh, land uh, fuel leachate has become a huge challenge in the field of wastewater treatment. <clears throat> land fuel leachate treatment usually requires a long chain of treatment process, including physical, chemical, and biological treatments. And uh, membrane technologies uh, like ultrafiltration and reverse osmosis uh, are usually used for uh, landfill liquid treatment. But this will have some problems like very serious with membrane flooring and uh, uh, high energy demand. These problems uh, prevent uh, the te membrane technology from the application in the landfill liquid treatment. <clears throat> Usually we want to develop some uh, simple process or some one step uh, separation for the landfill liquid treatment. And uh, membrane, techno membrane distillation uh, is such a uh, uh, technology uh, which, which uh, attracts uh, a lot of research attention in recent years. Uh, the MD uh, used a, a hydrophobic mem membrane as a uh, separation medium and the thermal gradient was established to dry the water molecules flow through the membrane. In this way, the non-volatile pollutants can be totally rejected by the MD. So MD has an uh, advantage like the high effluent quantities and the high tolerance to salinity and the low flowing uh, tendencies. But uh, if we use the MD in the uh, landfill liquid treatment, we still meet some problems. The first is the penetration of the ammonia, and the second is the flooring, uh, because there's a lot of flooring, uh, like um, uh, organic, inorganic, and microbial flooring in the landfill leachage. So uh, the flooring issues uh, should be considered. The final one, uh, finally, is the pore wetting. <coughs> we discussed a lot today. <coughs> the pore wetting can completely destroy the separation uh, performance of the MD. So uh, it's a very fatal, it's a very fatal problem. So, <clears throat> um, but uh, the uh, application of the MD in uh, landfill liquid treatment is not extensively investigated. So that's uh, still something unknown. For example, uh, the key flowering and the flowering me mechanisms. So uh, we need to uh, do more, uh, more investigations about, about this topic. Uh, the second part is the materials and, uh, and the methods. We build a self uh, cell made DCM system in our lab. And the system can then string pass. <coughs> uh, that's an uh, uh, empty cell, and there is a um, uh, uh, feed water circulation system and a uh, distillate circulation system. Uh, we get the distillate weight and the conductivity monitored so that we can, uh, uh, we can assess, the, uh, assess the membrane flooring and the wetting. This is the experiment uh, protocol. Uh, the experiment, uh, the experiment uh, consists of two parts. 
a short-term test and an extend test test. In a short-term test, the PVDF membrane was used to treat a mature landfill leachate, and the pH was changed to assess the, uh, the membrane flowering to assess the ammonia uh, re removal. In the extended test, uh, the PVDF and the PFE membrane was used to treat the young and the mature uh, <coughs> landfill leachate. And the experiment was extended to 15 days so that we can uh, assess the impacts of um, membrane, uh, membrane characteristics. <clears throat> okay, the third part is the experimental results. Uh, first of all, we invest we investigated the performance of this MD in land field leachate treatment. From this figure, we can find that the organic uh, rejection rate was, uh, uh, was generally higher than 98%. The change of the, uh, the, change of the pH, uh, pH, pH did not affect the organic rejection. We also used the fluorine sensor, um, fluorine sensor spectrometer to evaluate the organic removal. The fluorine sense intensity of the DSP lead is, uh, is uh, less than 0.3% uh, of, uh, of lead in free water. Uh, hence, uh, we can find that uh, MD is very efficient in removing the organics uh, in the landfill leachate. Uh, we also assess uh, the reduction of the metal ions. Uh, as, we, as we can see in this table, uh, all, the five, uh, all the five metal ions, including uh, uh, <clears throat> including uh, sodium, uh, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and ferric ions. The rejection rate is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, nearly uh, 100%. Uh, uh, moreover, we can find that the reject, uh, rejection rate was not affected by the uh, feed pH. <clears throat> because the ammonia is, uh, uh, is a volatile, uh, volatile pollutant, it can penetrate through the membrane uh, especially in alkaline conditions. So the rejections among ammonia uh, is, is around 15% at a pH of the uh, nine. When the pH was adjusted to the uh, five, the uh, rejection rate would increase to the uh, 96%. <clears throat> From this figure, we can find that uh, uh, because of the uh, penetration of ammonia, the distillate conductivity increased with uh, with the running of the system. And so we cannot use the uh, distillate uh, conductivity to assess the, uh, assess the membrane wetting. Uh, to address this problem, we use the, uh, we use the uh, fluorine sense intensity to uh, check whether the uh, uh, whether wetting occurred. Uh, we <coughs> <coughs> okay, uh, the first and the last 100, 100 milli, uh, Milliliter, uh, same, uh, milliliter distillate was sampled and uh, uh, detected. The, <clears throat> the fluorescent intensity was compared. It was found that the fluorescent intensity did not, uh, did not significantly uh, change. This indicated that the membrane wetting did not occur occurred, uh, when the landfill liquid was uh, concentrated by five times. Uh, the flowering is the most significant problem to, uh, investigated. <clears throat> the membrane flowering was uh, from these figures we can find that the flowering is strongly affected by the feed pH. Uh, the specific uh, flux decreased to uh, 0.3 when the pH was uh, feed pH was nine. Uh, when the pH was adjusted to five, uh, uh, the Price reduction was only thirteen uh, percent. Uh, only thirteen percent. The results indicated that the feed acidification can help to reduce the MD flowering. Moreover, uh, the contact angle and the LEP uh, LEP was also measured. Uh, from these figures, we can find that the <coughs> contact angle and LEP uh, both of them uh, decrease with the increasing uh, pH. Uh, <coughs> we can we can. Uh, we can infer from this result that uh, the membrane flowering is going to comprise, uh, com compromise the, the hydrophobicity of the membrane and uh, increase the risk of wetting. To get inside uh, into the flowering, the flowered membrane was uh, uh, characterized by the SEM and the FTR, uh, FTIR. 
we can find uh, we can find that the coverage of the membrane by the foreign layer uh, increased with increasing uh, pH, and we can find from the cross section cross section wheel that the uh, the thickness of the uh, thickness of the uh, foreign level also increase with increasing uh, increasing uh, beta pH. Uh, in this uh, in this page, we saw the EDS results and FPIR results. <clears throat> From the EDS results, uh, we can find uh, the signals of the uh, in organic elements uh, uh, increase uh, with increasing pH. And from the FDIR results, we find that the typical peaks of the membrane was weakened, but the peaks of organic was increased. Uh, from this result, we can uh, conclude that both organic and inorganic components uh, have already deposited on the membrane. Uh, <clears throat> to get uh, to un further understanding the following, uh, the chemical cleaning was performed and the cleaning waste was analyzed. Uh, there are two interesting points in this result. Uh, first, uh, we find that uh, there are a lot of organics in the acid cleaning waste. Usually, uh, we use the alkaline cleaning to remove the uh, organic foreigns. Uh, it's generally considered that the acid cleaning is less effective uh, in removing the organic foreigns, but uh, we find that uh, uh, there are a lot of organics in the uh, acid soaking uh, solution. The second uh, point is that uh, when the pH uh, when the pH increases uh, from seven to nine, uh, from seven to nine, the organics in the cleaning waste increase rather than decrease, <coughs> rather than decrease. From this result, we can uh, it can be found that the organic deposition was enhanced at a lower p uh, low pH condition due to the reduced uh, electronic repulsion. However. The organic deposition was also enhanced at the alkaline condition uh, due to the cohesion of the organics and the inorganic forms. This is uh, something we find we find it's uh, it's new. Okay, uh, after that we can uh, we conduct uh, an extended test uh, of the landfill liquid treatment with DCMD for fifty days. Uh, we also assess the performance and the following. Uh, from these uh, uh, figures, we can find that uh, we can find it. Uh, we can find it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the perform uh, the organic removal performance is very good uh, over the whole durations. Uh, the PTFE outperformed the PVDF, and uh, uh, is the uh, distillated COD is uh, generally less than 10, uh, 10 microgram per liter. <clears throat> we also uh, we also we investigated the revolution, uh, removal of the ammonia. The penetration of ammonia also exists uh, and result in increased uh, distillated conductivity. The penetration of the ammonia was not affected by the membrane types. Uh, the young uh, landfill leachate caused uh, more ammonia penetration due to the higher ammonia concentrations in the filter water. <coughs> the, Membrane covering was in state in, was investigated in terms of the flux reduction. Uh, for PVDF, the young land the young land field, uh, land field leaches, uh, which contains more biopolymers, uh, caused a more flux uh, more flux reduction during MD. Uh, for a PVDF, the material uh, the material land liquid land uh, field leaches caused a uh, more severe. Uh, boring, uh, because it contains more humic acid and organic ions. Uh, to better understand the boring, the SEM images of the boring membranes was taken. There are a lot of crystals, uh, crystals on the membrane followed by the uh, material landed village. Uh, for a PVD PF membrane, uh, the young land village causes much more organic deposit. Deposition, uh, resulting a very thick, uh, very thick foreign layer. Uh, foreign layer. Uh, this is consistent with the uh, most uh, severe uh, foreign in landfill leachate uh, treatment with the PVDF member. Based on this, uh, uh, based on this result, we can draw some um, uh, simple conclusions. Uh, MD is able to effectively reject organics and metal ions in the uh, landfill leachate. 
and the uh, membrane for the following is a dominant the membrane md following is a membrane dependent and uh, ph dependent uh, the following is dominated by the co-division of the organic and the inorganic forums at the neutral and alkaline conditions uh, with a steep civilification is able to improve the reduction of ammonia and that is reduce uh, md following okay uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, special thanks to uh, give to uh, Dr. Yang and my student, Ming Xiong. And uh, thanks uh, uh, to the uh, NCFC for the financial support. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Thank you so much for that great talk. Thank you. Okay. So. If anyone has questions, feel free to write them in the chat. I see we have one here. So uh, Fei Gua is asking, thank you for the interesting talk. What is the maximum concentration of landfill leachate by MD in your experiments? Is this a ZLD process? Okay, uh, can, can you ask, repeat your question again? Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, what is the maximum concentration of landfill leachate by MD in your experiments? So how high of a concentration did you get to? And also, is this a zero liquid discharge process? OK, uh, I think he means some, uh, some characteristic of the, of the landfill leachate. OK, uh, the, COD, the COD concentration is about 2,000 milli, uh, milligram per liter. Uh, per liter. And, uh, and the ammonia concentration is about uh, 200 to 300 uh, milligram per liter. And uh, with the temperature of the MD we use is uh, 60, uh, 60 C centigrade. Okay, is that okay? No. Yeah, and then I think that he was also asking uh, how much did you concentrate that solution? So do you know the final concentration of your feed after uh, MD treatment? Wait, wait, no, the, the landfill leachate was uh, concentrated for uh, five times, five times, yeah, in the short term, in the short term, um, uh, short term test. Uh, in the extended test, the, the, uh, the concentration factor is about five to 10. Okay, uh, we performed the experiment, experiment for 50 minutes. Great. And do you think that it could be used for actually zero liquid discharge all the way to a solid um, feed concentrate? I think, um, I think it's not now uh, because it's, um, it's quite expensive um, and uh, it's a uh, uh, energy uh, energy um, demand is very high. So in, in, in our country, we now use the, uh, the burning to deal with the uh, deal with the, the, the municipal solid waste. So um, some uh, waste energy can get from this, uh, this uh, uh, for example, uh, rubbish burning. Uh, so if we can use uh, this uh, uh, solid waste, uh, this uh, waste heat, uh, maybe we can use the MD to treat the landfill leachate. Uh. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I was going to ask one quick question. So you looked at the effect of pH to uh, improve ammonia rejection and improve fouling. Do you think there are any other operating conditions you could change to improve ammonia rejection or fouling or both? Okay, um, I think there's uh, two aspects we can do to uh, reduce the uh, fouling. Uh, for example, we can do some pre-treatment. Uh, uh, we can use the oxidation and the coagulation to reduce the foreign. Uh, the second way is uh, do some uh, optimization of the parameter factors, uh, for example, uh, the flux and the temperatures and uh, uh, circulator velocities. Uh, we can, uh, we can get, it, get them optimized. Uh, this is uh, something we can, we, can, we can find out here. Uh. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so we're still waiting to see if we can get our last speaker in. Uh, we don't have them here now. So if anyone has any questions for any of the speakers, feel free to enter those into the chat or the Q&A. 
and we can do a, a panel here. I'll ask uh, one more question for you, Feng Chu. Uh, do you think anti-fouling membranes could really improve the process a lot in MD? Do you see a place for those in applications like this? Or are um, operating conditions better? Okay, I just think that DCMD is the most uh, simple uh, configuration. So we, we, we can uh, easily uh, establish such a system in our lab. Um, but uh, uh, personally, I, I uh, I like the uh, vacuum MD better. Yeah, uh, I also did a, a, a VMD system in, in my lab. Uh, I used it to do uh, um, ANMDDR. Uh, it's a, uh, an aerobic uh, membrane distillation bio um, uh, MDR. You know, uh, it, we used the. Uh, we use the MD uh, membrane to uh, replace the, the outer or uh, to replace the outer filtration or microfiltration. Yeah. So we can uh, build it, uh, a new system yeah, uh, to treat uh, some uh, organic, uh, high concentration organic waste water. Um, so that we can, um, uh, we can <clears throat> generate it some, uh, you know, uh, CH4. You know uh, the medicine, uh, so that we can use the uh, recover the energy from the waste water, uh, so that uh, the the um, energy problems uh, of the MD maybe can can uh, be solved to some extent. So, so um, now I was trying to do more research on the VMD. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I, I think that might be promising too. Okay, so we have a, a couple more questions in the chat for you. So Alicia on is asking, do you plan to scale up MD for landfill leachate treatment? Yes, uh, yes, uh, you know, but uh, scale, scaling up is um, uh, it's, uh, not just a simple, uh, simple uh, problem. You know, uh, it, it needs uh, a lot of investment, yeah. Now we, uh, we, uh, cooperated with the uh, uh, landfill leachate. Uh, they are, um, uh, we now can, we now just uh, do some uh, experiment in the lab. And uh, for the next steps, uh, we will do uh, um, a bigger, uh, maybe maybe a, a pilot investigation uh, in, in, in the landfill leachate. Uh, okay. Nice, yeah. And so then as a follow-up to that, she asked if MD can be a competitive option compared to existing processes. Um, I read uh, some, uh, uh, I, I read a lot of articles. I think uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, saying that uh, when, there's a, uh, when they, there is a uh, waste of energy, uh, waste of heat, uh, the MD is um, uh, compatible to uh, to uh, reverse osmosis. Uh, you know, in China, uh, we use the DCM, uh, we use the MD to uh, use the reverse osmosis to treat the uh, landfill liquid a lot. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, there's still a lot of problems. For example, uh, the system is very complicated. It requires a lot of maintenance. maintenance. Uh, this will stop the uh, application of the membrane technology. So uh, I think if we can use the, um, I, I, I think the MD is a, uh, is a, a, sim is a much simpler si system. I think it's a one step process uh, because the MD can remove the organic uh, ions, uh, just um, lots of pollutants, just except uh, ammonia. Uh, so, I, I, I think uh, MD is much better than uh, our uh, reverse osmosis. But the, the, the only problem is, uh, is the uh, heat. 
is there energy? Okay. Yeah. Great. And then maybe we'll just do one last question and then we'll close the session here if we don't get our, our final speaker in. So uh, Faye Gua is asking, uh, as ammonia is very smelly, do you think the MD system should be sealed in a closed system? Of course, of course. And uh, it, it, if it can be sealed in a closed system, it, it will be good. You know, in my cities, uh, uh, all the wastewater treatment plant was, uh, was uh, um, uh, partially sealed. You know, uh, the gas is uh, smelly. So, it, uh, so we uh, do a lot of uh, work to uh, treat the uh, smell gas. Um, but I, I think uh, I have another work about uh, uh, MD is, a, is a to recover the uh, ammonia from the landfill leachate. Uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, uh, two stage of MD, uh, the first uh, in first uh, uh, stage the M, uh, pH was increased so that the ammonia can go through the MD membrane. Uh, in in the second stage, uh, the the pH was uh, was decreased. Then the ammonia was absorbed. Um, then in the second stage of MD, then the uh, the pure water goes through the membrane and the ammonia concentrated in the in the middle uh, so that uh, we can recover the ammonia. Um, I, 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 I'm doing that work in my lab, um, but um, um, uh, the progress is, is not, not, not very good. Mm. Yeah, interesting stuff. Okay, great. So thank you so much uh, to all so our much. speakers. Yeah, thank you for the extended Q&A session there. That was great. Um, I think with that, we'll end the session just a little bit early here. And yeah, thank you all. Uh, listen, everyone here, that it all went well, so you may uh, stop the recording now. Uh, I think uh, one way you have the host access, so you can stop the recording. Okay, I think maybe one way.